activities of the future would be laid out to a master plan. There must be broad avenues, providing trees and ease of movement, and light and pure air for all buildings. Another session of RBC Disruptors. I'm John Stackhouse, and it's my pleasure to host our uh, monthly conversation about innovation, disruption, and how technology is changing everything around us. If you're joining us by WebEx or Facebook Live, uh, welcome, and please join the conversation. Share your questions or thoughts with, uh, with us on Facebook as, uh, as we talk or afterwards. We're so lucky to have with us today Dan Doktoroff, the founder and uh, co-founder and CEO of Sidewalk Labs with us. Dan, welcome to Toronto, welcome to, uh, to RBC. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Dan, is, uh, he's got a great career, we'll talk a bit about that. Uh, but as I said, he co-founded Sidewalk Labs with Larry Page, one of the founders of uh, Google, and it's a true disruptor, trying to improve and change the way uh, we live and change our urban world. Uh, previously, Dan was CEO of Bloomberg, the media giant, and before that, he was deputy mayor of New York City, and with uh, Mike Bloomberg, the mayor, helped uh, rebuild the city after 9-11. Uh, after so, Dan, we're gonna, we've got so much to talk about t today. We'll talk about Sidewalk Labs, about your Keyside uh, project here in uh, Toronto, and about the state of cities globally, right. and uh, what, uh, what we can do to, uh, to improve that. Um, but maybe to kick off, we can start with uh, some snappers. You've had a fantastic career. I'd love to get your brief insights on uh, maybe, of, maybe from of four or five of the, uh, the chapters of those careers. So I'll, I'll throw those chapters okay. at you, All and right. uh, you can tell me what the, uh, what the takeaway or lesson was. So we'll start with uh, investment banking. Dan started as an investment banker. So any investment bankers in the audience, you too can be a disruptor. <laughs> I was just in it for the money. No, no really, um, you know, what I learned, the most important lesson was how to tell a story. And I think storytelling is so important to almost anything you do. When you have to sell a company or a bond issue or an equity issue, you have to learn to tell a story. Right. Next, bidding for the Olympics. When you were at New York, you tried to get the Olympics, went to London. What was the lesson? Uh, that... Uh, losing, which we, we lost, like Toronto did, um, <laughs> um, losing can, you can really redefine as winning. And our Olympic bid um, really created the agenda that we took into the Bloomberg administration. Working with Mike Bloomberg? Single best manager, empowerer I've ever seen. What, do, what, what made him the single best manager? There's just a way he empowered. His view was, my, my job is to pick great people, support them with resources, have their back whenever necessary. If I do that, I will unleash incredible creativity and, that's, and loyalty, and that's exactly what happened. And that, I think, is a lesson that I've tried to take with me throughout the rest of my career. That's fantastic. Then you ran one of the world's great media companies. What was your takeaway? Uh, you know, it's uh, the power of the network. You know, what, what Bloomberg has, you know, it's known for its media, but really the main business is selling a package of financial data and information to people in the financial markets. And they all sort of use the Bloomberg to communicate with each other, to trade with each other, to look at common analytics. And that fact that they all do all those different things together through this product means that its position is incredibly powerful. Um, we were very proud to uh, take significant market share from Reuters. <laughs> Last uh, quick background question. Lesson from dealing with the world's most outspoken developer. 
I think you know who I'm talking about. Yeah, I think I do. I, he, he was deputy mayor of New York for ep economic development. New when, York is famous for a uh, famous real estate guy. So I, the one-line answer uh, is what I saw is what you get. Uh, <laughs> I, I will tell you uh, one funny story about it, which is... Um, I don't know how many of you guys have been to New York and been to Columbus Circle. So it's this area at the southwestern corner of Central Park. And the city came into possession of a effectively abandoned art museum. Um, and so this was in 2002. The city's financial position was precarious. We decided to sell off this building in a prime location. Um, but the building was complicated. It had... Um, it had design protections and other things associated with it. It was kind of a weird building. And so we only got two bidders. One was um, this small museum um, that wanted to move to a more prominent location. Um, and then the other was our 45th president. Um, and of course, he bid all cash, um, bid a lot more money, um, and was willing to pay right then and there to turn it into a luxury boutique, presumably gold-plated hotel. The museum had no money whatsoever, offered less money, and would actually pay when it could. So needless to say, of course, we had to pick the museum. <laughs> <laughs> so you can imagine, I didn't make the call, but you can imagine sort of Trump's reaction when we told him that it went from you know, yelling to haranguing to threatening to eventually recognizing he's going to have to deal with us on other stuff, whimpering and <laughs> hanging up. <laughs> but I did not hear from him after that for 18 months until the day after The Apprentice debuted on NBC. That day I got a call from him. The only purpose of the call was to tell me the ratings of The Apprentice. <laughs> And then he called every week for the next three weeks to tell me the ratings of The Apprentice. So as I said, what I saw is what you get. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Hardly. Let's, uh, let's, let's turn to Sidewalk Labs. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so you were brave enough to do an a, uh, AMA and asked me anything on Reddit uh, last week, and I loved one of their questions, uh, which was, did you ever consider uh, f taking a PhD so people could call you Dr. Doctoroff? And your answer was, actually, your, your, your late mother uh, right. took that title. So I'll, I'll, I'll steal another question, <laughs> okay. which was uh, on uh, Sidewalk Labs. Explain it. Sure. Look, we like to describe ourselves as an urban innovation company, but we think the best way to innovate broadly and have the kind of impact that we'd like to have at what we think is a historic moment in time when there are a set of technologies that are now available that are converging, um, all sort of digitally based, that we believe can fundamentally bend the curve on quality of life, almost every quality of life metric in cities. And, but the best way we think to do it is to actually demonstrate how it can be done in a place. And ideally, in our view, a place where there's not a lot there to begin with, because your capacity to innovate is inversely correlated with the number of people, um, infrastructure, and other things that are there. So, you know, we conclude we actually wanted to help to build a place working in partnership with the local governments um, that would be able to demonstrate what life in the 21st century can be like, thoughtfully enabled by cutting edge technology when that is integrated into great urban design. That's fundamentally what we're about. So we're here to talk about disruption. What is it about cities that needs disrupting? It's not known so much that cities need disrupting. Um, and so I'm, uh, yeah, I, I kind of recoil at the notion of the smart city, to be perfectly honest, because I actually think cities are pretty smart. Um, you know, people make of cities, you know, what they want to and can, and yes, there are processes. See, I'm learning to be truly Canadian, say process rather than process. 
Um, so just by the way, Dan, process is not just a pronunciation. It's a way of life. I, that's what I've assumed. <laughs> I've also been taking lessons on how to say Toronto. Toronto, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm getting better. Um, in, in any event, um, I think cities are generally smart, but that doesn't mean they can't be better. And I said, we're at this moment in time when there's a set of technologies that we think can make them better. Um, we've, I, I like to call this sort of the fourth urban technology revolution that we think we're sort of just beginning right now. And the three previous ones, at least in modern times, would be driven by the steam engine in the early part of the 19th century um, that enabled through trains, you know, goods to come and people to come to cities, enabled the industrialization of cities. In the latter part of the 19th century, it was the electric grid, which made cities 24 hour, uh, made them vertical, made them easier to get around with subways and L's, et cetera. Uh, ultimately, obviously, enabled modern communication. And then the third one was the automobile in the early part of the 20th century. We think there's one now, mm -hmm. um, and it offers incredible opportunity. So, you know, this is really the moment to explore, I think, what is possible. Why not just let it happen organically is, if you believe as we do, and we've been studying this now for two years, that you can fundamentally improve life meaningfully, you also have to recognize that getting things done in cities is hard mm. um, for lots of reasons, some good, some not so good, and that having a place that demonstrates that can serve as a model that other cities can look to for inspiration, specific ideas, we think can usher in this area era faster. So you created Sidewalk Labs with uh, Larry Page. How, how did you guys meet? So it was actually through Eric Schmidt, um, who, you know, for many years was actually the CEO of Google. Um, he and I had known each other kind of casually. And when I decided to leave Bloomberg, because Mike decided he really wanted to come back to the company, and I didn't want to go back to being his deputy mayor, um, Eric reached out to me on behalf of Larry. Uh, the... Uh, Larry actually had been thinking about cities, thinks about them very deeply and had been for a long time, had been thinking about this problem. At the same time, I'd been thinking about what I wanted to do and really believing that there was this opportunity in urban innovation. Uh, so it was, uh, we spent about six months kind of dating and then finally decided to create Sidewalk Labs. And w what's Larry's vision that uh, captivated you? Well, again, it's, it's similar to what I've described. It's that we're at this moment in time um, when the set of digital technologies have the potential to fundamentally improve sort of have a life along almost every dimension, meaningfully reduce cost of living, uh, which certainly in cities like Toronto is important, um, to meaningfully enhance the environmental performance of a place achieve vision zero, give people time back in their day. And he's believed that for a long time, and I do too. You've described the, uh, your vision of the city as a platform. Right. Maybe you can explain a bit more of how a city can be like a smartphone, uh, as a smartphone, a platform. So we, we do describe sort of a city or a district as a, as, a, as a platform. In some ways, cities have always been that way. You know, if you think about a platform, it's sort of hardware today, we think of it, hardware, software, design guidelines, other rules of governance, um, and that then enables third parties, if it's open enough, to actually build on top of it. Um, so if you think about the smartphone as an example, um, the, you know, what makes the smartphone so revolutionary? Uh, if you think about you know, what, for example, Apple or um, others did, is they have this very elegantly designed piece of hardware that has in it you know, hardware and s contains software. Um, they created design guidelines so that it looked reasonably coherent. Um, and then they created, when they launched it, a set of applications so that it would be Fu functional, 
desirable. Um, but really the magic of the smartphone is that um, they enable through reasonably open um, APIs um, people to build all over the world to build on top of it, creating things that no one ever imagined were possible. Um, and that's what gives it sort of the power that it has. Cities you can never plan um, all the way down to the last detail because what you want is people's creativity and imagination and ideas as technology trends and tastes change to constantly add to the mix to keep it always surprising and interesting and relevant. And so if you think about a city in somewhat the same way, sort of view our job is to create ultimately the infrastructure, physical, digital, to some extent, the design guidelines, um, the rules as loosely as possible of governance, have it be very open and be able to access data, and for example, that gets produced from it, and create on top of it. And we think it's that way that the city becomes, uh, always remains fresh and interesting and responsive. So let, let's talk a bit more about how this will play out in Keyside. That's the, the, the name of the project uh, on, on, on the waterfront here. But first, maybe you can tell us how you came to select Toronto. You, you looked at 50 or more possible locations around the world. Uh, places we, 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 lo we looked all over the world, uh, mostly in the developed world. Uh, I think we looked at 51 different metropolitan areas um, in the in North America alone, we looked at hundreds of sites. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we thought Toronto was incredibly exciting for a number of reasons. One is, is the diversity of Toronto. Uh, I always used to say that New York was the most uh, diverse city in the world. I actually didn't know that Toronto is the least large city in the world. Um, it's also, I think, got sort of this incredible aspiration for inclusivity. Mm. Um, and that inclusivity um, is being challenged now, um, in part because Toronto, Toronto has been so open um, and so people are flooding here, you know, in the greater Toronto area, you know, 80, 100,000 or more a year which is putting all sorts of pressure on the city from an affordability perspective on the transit and transportation networks. That is having the impact of um, pushing middle income, lower middle, lower income people further and further out, denying them access to opportunity. So it struck us from outside that there's also this gap between aspirations for inclusivity and sort of the growing reality, which would make people here more open to new approaches and new ideas. You add on top of that um, the fact that um, there's a really growing tech cluster here, um, that this is a place uh, where we've seen all sorts of interesting urban innovation. It was not lost on us that Toronto was the place that, to which Jane Jacobs fled from New York. Um, and then, you know, in Waterfront Toronto, we had a great partner who's been practicing at developing along the waterfront for 15 years, who itself represents the three levels of government, so that alignment is important. And then on the waterfront, there's an incredible site. So you took all those things together, and we really thought this was the best place in the world to do this. I've said this before, I'll say it again, you know, if Amazon sees what we see here, it wouldn't even be a close call. Uh, but we're incredibly thrilled to have the opportunity to work with, and this is what's really important, we're never imposing a vision. We view the process of developing a plan, which we'll do over the course of the next year with our partners in government, with the local community, with Torontonians, the you know, provincial and national government, um, to, to co-create a plan that makes sense for this city and this country, but that hopefully also can serve as a model if we're but successful. Tell us a, a bit about how that uh, process will play out, but more importantly, how that model will be built. 
So said so we have a year essentially to develop a plan. And just to be clear, you know, all anyone has committed to us is give us the opportunity to develop that plan. We've committed to spend fifty million dollars to develop that plan. Um, at the end of the year, if people don't like it, and by the way, there shouldn't be any surprises since there's going to be tons of public outreach and engagement and said our governmental partners will be partners in the development of that product. But at the end of the day, if people aren't excited about it, they can just say no and we go away. Mm -hmm. uh, now, good question, which you haven't asked, but as a uh, former journalist, I know, and a great one, I know would ask is, well, why would you actually take that risk? Well, for the last two years, we've been really thinking about these problems very deeply. And as I said earlier, we're convinced that we can demonstrate how by really combining great urban design and cutting edge technology, we can dramatically lower the cost of living. Um, that we can actually create the first climate positive community in the world. That we actually think we can offer greater opportunity to people. And we can do it, by the way, in the context of a diverse community. Um, one of the commitments that we made right from the very beginning to each other is that, um, I'm saying to each other, meaning Google and us, is that you know, this place would be diverse, that it would reflect the socioeconomic or demographic diversity of the surrounding metropolitan area of wherever we decided to do it. And so we think it, we, we're convinced that we can have that kind of impact. Right. So the point of Keysight is to, to create a laboratory. Right. Try, try things out uh, with real people doing real things, li living real lives, and uh, harvest the data, learn, learn from that. Maybe we can talk a bit about some of the things you, you want to study. Uh, you mentioned climate uh, and, uh, and the carbon challenge of cities. What sort of ideas, what sorts of ideas have you been hearing that sort of spark your interest of what could be done at Keyside to lower a carbon f footprint of, a, of an urban environment? Well, this is a unique site. Um, among other things, because what you have um, with ash bridges is producing a lot of waste heat and at the same time, because of the lake, you have the potential for relatively inexpensive um, deep water cooling. The combination of them, what we think, can produce sort of the backbone of a um, energy system that would have really dramatically positive um, environmental um, Qualities. So we're, that's one example. There are lots of other components to it. it. Won't be one thing. It'll be a set of things. So we have a set of hypotheses at this point about what's possible, and now we're just in the process of thinking through them, doing more analysis on them. Um, but I think the early indications are is that from an environmental perspective, this place could be quite remarkable, actually. Mobility. So the, the core of our thinking about mobility is at the district. Um, at, at Sidewalk Toronto would ultimately be all autonomous vehicles um, within the district. And the district, obviously, the size of it will be to be determined as we move forward. But you know, when you think about autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars, um, and you assume them in a reasonably controlled environment, um, so many things begin to change. You know, I talked about the automobile being the third urban technology revolution. So much of what we now understand as urban life has changed because of the automobile. You know, we had to accommodate parking. Uh, we had to separate roadways because we now suddenly had these very dangerous things in our midst, and that took lots of space. So just as one example, of what eliminating the traditional automobile does is it enables you to buy back an enormous amount of space. Uh, most cities you know, in North America, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the space is taken up by separate roadways mm -hmm. and parking. If you can reclaim that, you can double the amount of public open space 
um, in a place, putting everybody within a very short walk, for example, of a park. We talk about the integration of smart urban design and technology. That's a classic example of that. Well, you know what happens when everybody is really close to a park, um, then maybe their apartments to achieve the same sort of quality of life don't need to be exactly the same number of square foot. When you think about mobility and you think about autonomous mobility, you think about freight and freight delivery. Imagine, for example, if freight could be delivered underground, the cost of freight delivery actually goes down dramatically when it's autonomous. Um, maybe what you don't need to do is store the same amount of stuff in your home or in your apartment, which also can potentially reduce the cost of housing without sacrificing quality of life. We've actually calculated, and these are very preliminary, that if you begin to go to a different approach to mobility that within the district would include kind of on-demand autonomous vehicles, um, that would include lots more bike sharing, more walking in a much denser um, mixed-use environment where to get out you relied more on shared services like zip car or shuttles as well as mass transit that for the average family you could lower the cost of mobility by maybe six thousand dollars a year which is huge mm -hmm. so these are the types of things that we're exploring right now so you're thinking of having underground freight delivery potentially that's cool. We have, to, we have to weigh how much it actually yeah. costs. But it could be for freight. It could be for uh, garbage hauling. Mm -hmm. um, it could be for putting utilities underground where they can be easily accessed. You know, here in Toronto, in New York, how much of a problem is it when we're constantly digging up streets um, as opposed to potentially accessing them from underground where they'd actually be well documented and easily repaired from underground, saving all the problems that exist on the streets. So, you know, you can begin to really rethink that urban environment with just a couple of major changes. So I, I think you uh, just answered one of the questions from WebEx, which is how to design an, an autonomous only neighborhood that's inclusive for people who presumably can't afford such uh, vehicles, have, uh, have vehicle sharing. Does that answer that problem? I think it's part of it. Um, I think I said I talked about housing and affordability of housing and how you can actually lower the costs on the housing side. We're looking at a whole bunch of different things to make housing more affordable. New construction technologies ranging from modular construction to cross laminated timber, which we think can lower the cost. Um, where we believe that it's possible to improve building codes and zoning codes when you have the ability to actually monitor you know, what's happening to them in real time. You think about zoning, and not sure exactly what the parallel would be in Toronto, but in New York, for example, in Soho, you know, the loft building you know, went from being a factory to artist studios to luxury condominiums and now offices and retail. And those transitions took place over roughly 100 years. Each one occurred extremely slowly, painfully. Why? Because we had zoning codes or something equivalent in place that limited their uses. Because we were always worried about one neighbor affecting another neighbor. Well, today, in today's world, we can actually monitor noise. We can monitor things like smells. We can monitor you know, heat and other things in real time in ways we couldn't before, which may give us the ability to make our buildings much more flexible, our neighborhoods more flexible, which may in fact encourage new forms of construction as well so that the transaction costs are lower, which actually would lower the cost of, of occupancy. You're also foreseeing or envisioning a lot of bike lanes, a lot of pedestrian walkways. Don't know if you've been outside today. Um, <laughs> On, on the waterfront, that may be a challenge in months like January. How do, how, how do you address that? Well, you know, actually one of the key aspects of, uh, that we're looking at, particularly important here, is weather mitigation. We've done a lot of work on weather, weather mitigation, and whether that is, you know, um, sun or rain, sh snow, shielding, heating of path pathways, um, sort of different technologies with things that can come in and out that, again, provide protection. 
we actually think that you can almost double the amount of comfortable days outdoors. That's not going to say on a day like today, most people are going to bike. Um, but if you can double that, then that's a meaningful achievement and makes it a much more appealing place. So all of this depends, of course, on people. Uh, in the initial phase, how many people do you think would be living in, uh, in Keysight? You know, in, 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 the, in the first 12 acre phase, um, it might be 5,000 or so um, with also commercial activity. One of the things that we have said is that we will um, move Google's Canadian headquarters um, to uh, the eastern waterfront. Um, so we do want this place to be very mixed use, uh, but um, you know, over time it could expand quite significantly depending on what happens with the rest of the waterfront. So presumably, given that this is a laboratory, you want a fair bit of diversity yes. among those 5,000 people. Uh, we were talking earlier about the, 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 sort of the, the natural population to move into a place like this would be young techies. Uh, and if you have affordable housing, maybe uh, that uh, adds a number of people there. But that doesn't represent the general population, therefore isn't terribly interesting to cities around the, the world to, to, uh, to learn from. How do you ensure you get, I'd like to say, like the, the plumber from Scarborough right. to, move, uh, to move into this Well, the first, this thing, the first thing you do is you have to understand um, what they're interested in and what might prevent them from actually moving into a more urban environment. And I don't presume to have all the answers to that, but I think it's fair to assume a big part of that um, that might induce people to move from one environment um, into the other is cost. And to the extent that we can be <laughs> successful and meaningfully lower the cost of living, I think you have a much better chance. We did some feasibility studies. We didn't do them here in Toronto, but we did them in three other locations, kind of applying, and this was a set of feasibility study, we didn't actually do it, but applying a lot of the thoughts on innovation into three specific locations. And we felt in those three cases that we could reduce the cost of living by about, you know, 15 percent. So now imagine for that family that makes $80,000 a year, if you can save them, you know, 15%, 12, say $12,000 a year, um, that's a meaningful change in people's lives. Are they willing to try a different lifestyle in order to do that? Some will, not all of them. You know, we talked a little bit about open space. You know, it's important. I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. Um, I grew up in, you know, a place where having a backyard was critical to me and to my family and the way I lived. And yeah, um, that is going to be a barrier to getting people to moving in from a suburb. Um, on the other hand, if I can do what I just said and double the amount of space and put everybody literally within a stone's throw of really good public space, does that change that equation for people somewhat? So I think there's going to be a combination of things as we understand the market better, as we understand people's desires better, that we can put together to create the kind of place that reflects the diversity of the entire area, as I've described. It's a, nobody's saying it's easy. None of this is easy, by the way. This is all really hard. Um, but we think, based on the work we've done, that it's really quite possible. So you've got a, a new book out, a terrific book, especially if you're interested in New York. Uh, you may have wanted to call it Make New York Great Again, but I think you called it Greater Than Ever. Uh, and uh, in, in it, you quote uh, wonderful author E.B. White uh, in his reflections on, uh, on New York. And he has a great line, the, the settlers bring passion. Uh, settlers has become a bit of a difficult word uh, in this day and age, but the point is still valid, that people moving into an area bring with them passions that uh, create that urban vibe that we all know and appreciate. What sort of passion do you want the so-called settlers to bring into Keyside? Well, I, I would hope that people would, to some extent, be motivated by a desire to do something different and be a part of maybe setting a global standard. You know, one of the great opportunities, we think, and it's easy for us as outsiders to say this, but for Toronto, is to really have the opportunity 
to set the global example for what urban living can actually be. We all acknowledge there's all these problems. They're not unique to Toronto. Um, and that here we have an opportunity through this example or laboratory to demonstrate to the world what is possible. I also believe, by the way, here in Toronto, we have an opportunity to become, if you think about this place as a platform with people from the Toronto tech ecosystem creating on top of it, and they don't have to be technologists either, just people thinking of new ideas for the place, but also people from around the world, whether that's entrepreneurs, companies, you know, universities, et cetera, to actually become the hub of a whole new industry, um, which is urban innovation. Mm -hmm. And to create that here as the hub, I think is incredibly compelling. A third thing uh, is that, you know, we, we also really see this as promoting the kind of tech ecosystem in Toronto. And we also see the opportunities to demonstrate what's possible, not just to, to do it on this site, but to do it throughout the Toronto area. And, you know, we're going to start earlier, re relatively early this year with a set of pilots for ideas to demonstrate what might be possible. Um, but they don't have to be on the waterfront or you know near the site. So, yeah, we think that the opportunity for Toronto is very exciting. But hopefully, what people will be drawn to, getting back to your question, is excitement of doing something, you know, just that's different and new. Um, but the only reason they're ever going to do it is because they are convinced that for them, it offers really meaningful benefits, and it's up to us to be able to demonstrate that to people. So they'll also be uh, presumably willing to be measured or at least mo monitored. And that takes us into a good question here from Facebook about privacy and the, the governance uh, systems that you're talking about with, uh, with, the, with, with the city. How will you, will you innovate, harvest, and study data while at the same time protect people's uh, privacy? Well, the first thing I should say is we view this issue of privacy and data protection as fundamental to actually doing anything here. If we can't satisfy people on that dimension, then we will not be successful. And as a result, we've already begun the process of engaging with privacy experts, with, um, with our government partners at Waterfront Toronto, and that will be expanded to others, um, consulting people from all over the world about this. Um, and you know, we've already articulated a couple of principles that we will live by. One is that privacy and privacy protections will be built into um, the products that we actually deploy or use here. A second is, is that we're not going to use data for commercial purposes. Data will be used to improve quality of life. A third is that the processes that we actually use to develop those po policies will be open and collaborative. And so that over the course of this year, as we're also developing the plan for the place or the idea for the place, um, we'll be engaging in a, in a proce process to actually, um, to actually develop those privacy uh, and data rules as well. Um, so it, it's absolutely fundamental. Um, and, you know, since I don't think the purpose is just to collect data to monetize it, I know it's not at all. Um, I think we're going to be able to work with people to come up with something that makes sense. Now, it's also, we, what we talked for a second about setting a global example. Mm -hmm. We all know that this issue of, you know, data and privacy, particularly in public space, is an issue that we're all wrestling with every day. One of the great opportunities we think here is to do that here in a really disciplined, thoughtful way, again, that may set a global standard. Another question from Facebook. Are, are there only renters in the district? No, we don't know. For, we don't know. I think it'll probably be a combination of ownership and rental, but we don't, we don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Another, another good Facebook question. Toronto, as you, you, you know, is a city of neighborhoods, and each is fairly distinct uh, and uh, sort of has grown up organically. How do you ensure 
that a neighborhood, uh, a truly organic neighborhood, emerges in Keyside when you're trying to literally engineer uh, the, uh, the district? I think it goes back to this notion when we talk about organic. What organic means is that it changes as people's interest and taste and technologies change, that it is created in a spirit of openness that people can actually add to it just like they would in any traditional urban environment. Um, so that means the data itself has to be open and available to people mm. so that they can use it. It means that the processes have to be clear and um, ultimately people have the say in their environment that gives them the ability to change it. All we're doing is trying to create sort of said the, the platform in order for that to actually happen. And whatever data you're collecting is available globally. It's, op it's truly open? I, we, had, we haven't decided on the final policies. It's too soon for that. But the assumption is, is that this is going to be an open platform. Okay. Another question from Facebook about uh, sort of the diversity of the GTA of the greater Toronto area. And downtown is hardly representative of Scarborough or Mississauga. How do you ensure that there's a relevance in this downtown experiment for suburbs or, or, or very different cities? I think, I think two, two ways to do that. The first is when we talk about diversity, said the way we defined it is as representative of the surrounding metropolitan area. So in this case, talking about the GTA, not just the downtown core or not even just Toronto, but we would like to kind of have it be representative of the GTA. Now, and there's no precise science to that, but that's the aspiration. The second thing is to make it relevant to people's potentially to do some of these pilots in areas that are not downtown, not in the core, not on the waterfront, so that people begin to understand what might be possible and have it be some of the innovations be applicable in other parts of the GTA other than this particular site. Maybe we can uh, turn the conversation a bit to your partnership model. Your, your team has suggested that maybe 80% of the work that will be done in Keyside is going to be done with partners. Can you shed some light on how you want to go about partnerships, how entrepreneurs in Canada or elsewhere should engage with you, uh, or how big companies, uh, if they're relevant, or public institutions might engage with you? Well, we've already started that process. You know, for example, we talked about um, the energy system in this place. It happens that a local company is an expert in these kinds of systems. We've already begun those conversations and been having them actually for several months. Um, and that's going to be true across sort of everything that we do is that, you know, if we're pretty open about what it is we're looking to do, uh, if we're aggressive at reaching out um, to um, companies, if we make ourselves available to understand what is actually possible, what people are working on, there should be plenty of opportunities for people to engage. Just last week we had, you know, a large meeting for potential partners. Um, you know, on our website, I think that's just sidewalktoronto.ca, there's a section for partnerships. Uh, this is not, we, we will not be hard to find and we will be aggressively reaching out, but again, it, the more important part is really about the approach and the philosophy and that when you think of this place as a platform where your job is in fact to create the conditions for other people to innovate on top of, um, then hopefully that will occur you know, as organically as it possibly can. How, how much of the technology and entrepreneurship do you think will come from Toronto and from, and from Canada? Hard to know the precise um, percentage, but you know, from our, from our perspective, the more the better without ultimately sacrificing sort of the desire to create something that really sets the, creates the leading edge in right. terms of technology. But, you, but you're open to global ideas, global partners absolutely. coming in and trying no, things. No, a absolutely. On the other hand, we also see this as a huge opportunity to enhance the ecosystem here in Toronto and Canada as well. I think we will find hopefully the right balance between those two things. We, we don't see this as like a bunch of global companies coming in and taking over. We hopefully will find the right kind of balance. Right. One of your partners, as you uh, referenced earlier, is government. And it's a complex structure here, especially with Waterfront Toronto being owned or controlled by three levels of government. That can be good and it can also be complex and uh, slow. Curious what your 
what you learned uh, in public life in New York that might apply here in terms of managing those natural tensions between uh, entrepreneurship and innovation and government and bureaucracy? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny thing. My single greatest lesson, um, actually I had two great lessons from government that are germane to this. The first is what I call Dr. Off's theorem. And very immodestly. <laughs> <laughs> no one else calls it that but me. But uh, it was the degree of difficulty of getting anything done, this is in a New York context, is equal to the sum of x plus 3y plus 10z plus infinity. <laughs> where x is the number of city agencies involved, y is the number of state agencies involved, Z was the number of federal agencies involved, and infinity was if the Port Authority was involved. <laughs> and the point is, the more people who are involved, the more complicated it gets. And, and that's just a reality, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, that said, the second rule is, I think in order to really be effective in these kinds of complicated environments, or the most effective people and organizations are ones that manage to basically operate at two speeds at the same time. And those two speeds are patience, because there's process for everything. There are a lot of people who have to be touched who are given legitimate vested interests in the outcome of a um, pro project. Um, at the same time, if you don't act with a sense of urgency at all times, um, everything dies of its own weight. Mm -hmm. And managing that capability to operate at two speeds at the same time is going to be critical here. So we have to be you know, aware of what's necessary to get done. There's lots of people who you know, have really important interests in SAIS, and, and we have to be really respectful. We have to be incredibly humble about that. At the same time, there's a lot of work to do. This is incredibly complicated, and we have to kind of move as quickly as we possibly can. And if we can manage that tension, then hopefully we have a better chance of getting something done. We've got a couple of sector-specific questions that have come in from uh, Facebook. One is on financial services. The other is on mobile technology. Toronto, uh, as you know, is home to uh, some large financial institutions, uh, as well as some big uh, cab uh, cable and uh, yep. telephone companies. How should they be thinking about Keyside and plugging into not only the, the, the efforts you're doing, but to urban innovation more, more generally? Well, you know, look, they all have their own initiatives that they are undertaking, most likely, just like any other sector or company. You know, as what we're doing becomes, through the public processes, kind of more and more apparent as we reach out to people, as people reach out to us, I think it'll happen relatively naturally. Uh, you know, we're looking for partners. As you said, the overwhelming majority of things that happen here will be done by third parties, fully disproportionately Torontonian or Canadian. Um, and you know, that process has actually already begun in its early stages. So whether it's financial services or cable or media, you know, I don't think they're any different than any other sector that you know, they may want to try out you know, a completely different type of engagement with um, you know, a, a retail bank with, with cons customers, you know, this may be a great place to try it out, um, depending on sort of what is offered here. Another good question here from Facebook on translating learnings. A bit, bit early probably to have a, a conclusive statement on this, but what's your thinking in terms of how you will translate the learnings from Keyside to, uh, to the greater city or to cities elsewhere? Well, I think the first thing is, is that we'll be quite open about what we are doing. Um, we already started that. Um, for anyone who's interested in learning a little bit more about some of our original ideas, um, we posted the 200-page response to Waterfront Toronto's RFP online, again, at sidewalktoronto.ca. Um, not, not suggesting you should read it all in detail, but 
um, it will give you a sense for at least some of the original ideas that existed at the time that we submitted the RFP response. Um, so, you know, that I think is the first thing, is to be open about what we're thinking about. Um, the second, I think, is as we do it, um, to very accurately measure the impacts. Um, you know, one of the real goals for us in doing this is what we call replicability. We want, whether in this, in the GTA or beyond, um, what we do to be seen and hopefully other places to learn from them. In order to do that, you have to be able to document um, what you're doing, the successes, and by the way, the failures. Um, and so I think you'll see a regime of documenting kind of how things are going in a way that's probably not very common for kind of normal place building. Um, I, I've always believed that the, one of the great power of this idea is that other people will see it and in their own way adapt it, copy elements of it. I was, I was struck, you know, when I was deputy mayor, one of the projects that uh, I was particularly proud to play a role in um, was the saving of the High Line. Uh, and I don't know how many of you guys have been to New York and, and been on the High Line, um, but arguably it is sort of the most successful urban park that's been done in decades. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of cool how the Bentway actually borrows from it on some way and some levels. In any event, um, we opened it up in 2008. Within one year um, after it opening up, uh, and um, it clearly was a success. There were 36 high lines under development around the world. Um, cities copy other cities. Um, the dynamism that exists among cities looking to learn from each other, competing with each other, sharing with each other is so fabulous that if we can demonstrate kind of impact here, mm -hmm word will spread. Now, Sidewalk Labs is not a follower in that. You want to be, or you are a leader in it, and Keyside is not your only uh, project, or you've this got a the, portfolio. This is, core, this is the core of what we're doing, though. But you've got other investments. How do you see Sidewalk Labs sort of growing over the next uh, half decade and, and maybe uh, leveraging what you're seeing at Keyside? Our, our focus here is in Sidewalk Toronto. That is the core of what we're doing. Everything we do directly or indirectly relates to that. Now, when I say indirectly, we may build a capability here that um, may ultimately be commercializable in other places. Um, but for right now, this project is so complicated um, and so multi-layered that we have to focus on this or else there's no chance that we'll ever kind of gain the kind of public support and enthusiasm for what hopefully will be a great plan in order to pull it off. So we're pretty obsessively focused here. That's why I'm up here pretty much every week. Our team um, is up here. We're gonna be building the team up here so that it's more heavily weighted to Toronto. Um, most, you know, almost everyone now is in New York, but that composition will change. So this is, this is really our focus. What's your, uh, what's your biggest worry? I worry about everything. Uh, no, it's just look, at the end of the day, um, getting anything big done in a complex urban environment is hard. And I said, I respect that. Um, I live through it. If, and until you've actually um, played the role in rebuilding, for example, the World Trade Center site, um, which I did for six years, you know, you um, can't really appreciate just how difficult everything is and how it's, but through listening and reflecting and getting people engaged in the process, process that you actually, it's <laughs> not quite there yet. Um, <laughs> You, uh, uh, you're able to get things done, but you say, what's the biggest, the biggest risk? It's just, it's complicated, there's lots of parties, and we're not smart enough um, to figure out how to work through them all. 
I'm optimistic we are. We've built an incredible team. You know, I, I, we've literally looked at every attempt to build a smart city or innovation district over the last 50 years, and there isn't one that actually can stand as a model of success. Mm -hmm. And I, I think to a large extent, um, the reason they didn't is they weren't able to cross what we call the urbanist technologist divide. Um, you know, urbanists, people who think about cities, plan cities, build cities, generally do not understand, speak a completely different language from the technologist. And technologists are usually not sensitive enough in any way to the real world realities of a complex urban environment. We have built a team right from the very beginning that consists of both of people, by the way, on each side who are predisposed to understand the other perspective. And so I think we're building the right kind of team with the right kind of discipline, with the right sensitivities to actually be successful, uh, but you never know until you do it. And we also think, you know, I mentioned humility a second ago, look, we're not from Toronto. There's a lot to learn. Um, hopefully we're coming up but you know, we don't have the intuitive understanding of how people feel and think here, and so we have to get up that curve much more quickly. So before we go, I'd, I'd like to mention that as a token of our appreciation, a donation is uh, being made at uh, Dan's request to Target uh, ALS. Target ALS is a privately funded consortium of uh, researchers uh, wor working on this. Love a few thoughts from you on well, why you picked that. Uh, first of all, th th thank you very much. Um, this is probably more personal than uh, uh, I should, but my father uh, died of ALS, uh, my uncle did too, um, and therefore sort of it's in the family. And when uh, my uncle who died later was first diagnosed, I decided that I really had to do something about it. And so I have either uh, committed or raised, I think about $70 million now um, over the last six or seven years. Um, and we've created an organization that really has created as a new approach to um, research in ALS. And it, it focuses much more on collaboration as well as common facilities that researchers can uh, access in order to do their work. And it's been, I think, really successful, both in terms of the science and the progress that's been made, not just because of what we're doing, but the field as a whole, has really progressed nicely. Um, but as importantly, drawing more and more people, both in academia and in the private sector, biotech, pharmaceutical companies, into the fields to the point where, you know, for the first time, I'm actually optimistic that at some point, you know, within the not hugely distant future, there will be treatments for people with ALS. And, you know, if we can help play a role in that, um, maybe there's nothing more important that I'll ever do. What a wonderful tribute to, uh, to you. your father and your uncle. So, Dan, thank you. Um, on behalf of RBC and RBC Disruptors, thank you. It's such a, thank you very much. Such a pleasure to spend time with you. Uh, we wish you all the, all, all the luck, and we're going to stay in touch on, on, on this because it's an extraordinary lesson in, in, in innovation for people really around the world. But uh, thank you for what you've, uh, what you've uh, been doing. Uh, thank you all for joining us in person or on WebEx and uh, Facebook. Please mark your calendars for February 22nd. Our next RBC Disruptors will feature Marianne Turk, a Canadian who is running the NFL Network and trying to uh, disrupt and reinvent the big leagues. Uh, so we'll uh, be lucky to have her right after the Super Bowl. Uh, stay tuned for more details on RBC Connect, and you can continue following our conversation uh, on uh, the topic that we've had today. And uh, you can listen to our podcast, RBC Disruptors, uh, which will feature Dan in the uh, upcoming days. Thank you again, Dan, for your time today. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.